I'm your host, Scary Pops, and everybody loves a good scare. So let's get into it. The Velisica Axe Murder House in Velisica, Iowa. It's a well-known tourist attraction for ghost hunters and horror lovers alike. The site of a gruesome unsolved 1912 murder in which six children and two adults had their skulls completely crushed by the axe of an unknown perpetrator. The house was purchased in 1994 and restored to its 1912 condition and converted into a tourist destination. It currently costs $428 a night to stay at the old haunted home where visitors always report strange paranormal experiences, such as visions of a man with an ax roaming the halls or the faint screams of children. But in November of 2014, the haunting took a darker turn as Robert Stephen Lawrenson Jr., 37 of Rylander, Wisconsin, was on a regular recreational paranormal visit with his friends when true horror struck. His companions found him stabbed in the chest in an apparently self-inflicted wound, called 911, and Lorson was brought to a nearby hospital before being helicoptered to Creighton University Medical Center in Omaha. The Montgomery County Sheriff's Office said that he suffered the self-inflicted injury at about 12.45 a.m., which is around the same time the 1912 axe murders in the house began. Lawrenson recovered from his injuries, but never spoken publicly about what occurred that day. And for Martha Lynn, the owner of the home, the incident was very upsetting. It's publicity, but it's not exactly the kind of publicity you desire to have. I don't want people thinking that when they come to the Lysica Axe Murder House, something's going to happen that's going to make them do something like that. The house remains open for tourist visits and overnight stays today. Are you ready to book your visit? A Deadly Exorcism In August 2016 in North London, the 26-year-old Kennedy Ife began acting strange and aggressive following a pain in his throat. He reportedly bit his father and he threatened to cut off his private parts and complained of a python or snake inside of him before his family restrained him to a bed with cable ties and excessive force. The BBC reported that the family then set about attempting to cure Kennedy to restraint and prayer over the next three days. His brother Colin told the police, it's clear that thing was in him, what we believed was a demon because it was not natural. It was clearly trying to kill him. We had to restrain him for himself. It was clear that if we didn't restrain him, he could have tried to harm people in our family. Kennedy Ive had been bound to his bed for three days without medical attention when his brother called emergency services, explaining that Kennedy was complaining of dehydration he appeared to have developed breathing issues and was pronounced dead at 10.17 a.m. The Independent reported that while police were at the house, Colin allegedly carried out an attempted resurrection by chanting and praying for Mr. Ive. All seven of Kennedy Ive's family members were accused of manslaughter, false imprisonment, and causing or allowing the death of a vulnerable adult. An autopsy revealed over 60 wounds, including a possible bite on Kennedy's body. And his father, Kenneth Eif, along with four of his brothers, sustained injuries as well. Kenneth told the jurors he ordered his sons to take shifts and use overwhelming force, but denied that an association with cults or secret societies played any part in the death. After a four-day jury deliberation, all seven family members were cleared of charges on March 14, 2019. Utah murder-suicide. In September of 2014, a Utah teen returned to his home to find his parents and three siblings dead. 
In a notebook, there was a to-do list that had been scribbled on the pages. The list looked as if the parents were ready to go on vacation. Items such as feed the pets, find someone to watch after the house was written in the book. However, the Salt Lake Tribune reported it appeared to be murder-suicide, but there was no suicide note, no prior indication that they would do this. There was no explanation. The police could not figure out why two parents would kill themselves and then three out of the four children. For a year, no one knew exactly what happened to the family or what would drive the parents to do something so unthinkable. Later, the police would release more chilling details in the case. According to accounts from family members in an investigation by police, the parents were driven by a belief that the apocalypse was coming and an obsession with a convicted killer. As the Washington Post reported, friends and family told police that the parents were worried about the evil in the world and wanted to escape the pending apocalypse. But most assumed they just wanted to move somewhere off the grid. Investigators also found letters written by Christy Strack to one of the state's most infamous convicted killers, Dan Lafferty. Dan Lafferty was convicted in the 1984 fatal stabbing of his sister-in-law and her one-year-old daughter. According to trial testimony, he killed the victims at the order of his brother, Ron Lafferty. Ron Lafferty claimed to have a revelation from God. The story became a book called Under the Banner of Heaven. Police said Christy Strack became friends with Dan Lafferty, and she and her husband even visited him in prison. I've always been a huge fan of carnivals, and I would attend them every summer. The majority of rides, such as the roller coasters, were an obvious choice for thrill seekers such as myself. And one of my all-time favorites is the classic steel roller coaster with its deep drops, sharp turns, and of course its exhilarating loops. As I fell in line, I could hardly breathe from the congestion, but convinced myself that it was worth the wait. I was always wary for my safety because of movies like Final Destination, but more importantly because of an actual death that occurred at this very same carnival. The majority the majority of rides such as the roller coasters were an obvious choice for thrill seekers such as myself. I made sure to always keep those thoughts in the back of my mind though, considering I didn't want to tarnish the experience. As I gradually moved along the lineup, I had this nagging feeling that someone was gazing at me from amongst the crowd. Looking across a sea of people, it was difficult to pinpoint where that strange aura emanated from, and this feeling of being watched was really creeping me out. But as I got on the coaster, I felt a tingling sensation down my spine. I turned my head and saw a deranged woman with a bloody gash on the side of her face. Get off the ride now! What? Is this everything okay? Get off the ride now! And why would I get do that? She began repeating herself while slamming her forehead against the ride's handlebars. And then, I got startled by the sight of an obese old man. His shirt didn't fit right, and he lifted it up, exposing a hairy belly soaking in sweat. As I gazed my eyes back towards the woman, there was no sign of her. I shook my head and tried to get it out of my mind, convincing myself it was nothing but mere imagination. Approaching me little by little, I averted my gaze, hoping the man would skip the vacant seat next to me. However, my worst fear was realized when he forced himself to fit in the vehicle's frame. Annoyed by the simple fact he was too big, he yelled at one of the staff, saying, Hey, you! Why are you just standing there? Help me fit into this thing! The staff reluctantly replied, I'm sorry, sir. The vehicle has a maximum limit, but if I may... What the hell are you trying to say? The old man interrupted, his eyes glaring at the staff. Then, two other attendants arrived at the scene, persuading Mr. Piggy to get off the platter, but to no avail. And so, with all their might, they squeezed his body and he needed a sigh. As the coaster was getting ready to launch, I felt the old man's greasy body pressing against my arm. I don't know what condition he had, but he appeared to have pus-filled bumps underneath his skin, which caused my stomach to churn even before the coaster was launched. Upon eavesdropping, I heard some operators talking about a slight technical glitch, raising a couple eyebrows and pulses from the riders. However, that wasn't the only thing that bothered me, though. Since it was going to take longer for the coaster to start, it meant that I was stuck here next to a guy who was anything but attractive. 
Hey. He whispered in a seductive but revolting way. Hey there, cutie. Don't worry. At least we'll get to spend more time together. What? Look, we don't even know each other, okay? So stop talking to me. I reply. Oh, it's my lucky day. I never thought I'd sit next to a girl who tickles my funny bone. You're so hot. You must like a lot of things. <laughs> I ignored him after that. Then, when the operators had given us the thumbs up, the coaster finally slowly climbing up the slope. But with the introduction of the ride gradually taking place, there wasn't much to distract me nor the creepy old man who was adamant. He thought I was playing hard to get, and so he pursued me intending to get my number, social media accounts, home address, and all other personal stuff, which made me more uncomfortable than I already was. Hey babe, look how high we are! Unbelievable! This ride is still going up! Can you take a wild guess what else is going up? He said, drooling on his belly. The stench of his breath was so unbearable that getting to the highest peak felt like forever. This is the only time I'm gonna say this, so make sure you get it through your thick skull. Stop talking to me. <laughs> Whatever you say, pumpkin. He replied with a wink. Then, as we finally reached the sun, convinced he'd already thrown himself, the man licked my face out of the blue. My skin then felt covered in nasty goo. I desperately wanted to get off the cart, but we were so high up that I couldn't take my hands off the handle. Besides, at any moment, the coaster would resume and release the entire vehicle, allowing gravity to take its course as we raced through the tracks. In a nutshell, I simply had no choice. People from the other carts were now glancing at us like we were a couple in the middle of a lover's quarrel. Then, seconds later, I took a sidelong glance and noticed the old man was annoyed by all the unwanted attention. And with a surprisingly swift move of his arm, he placed it around my shoulders and yelled, Piss off, all right? Mind your own business! I know my girlfriend's chicken out, but that's why I'm here! All she needs is me! I looked him in the eyes and said, Cut it out, will ya? When was the last time you looked at yourself in the mirror? Who would want to have a sweaty, stinky, wild boar for a boyfriend? Oh yeah, no one. All the others chuckled, eyeing the creepy old man with prejudice. I was afraid I might have struck a wrong chord, but it was too late to worry about that now. Besides, this would all be over in a jiffy. Then, as the ride was released, allowing momentum and acceleration to guide a thrilling experience, the creep beside me started trying to unbuckle my seatbelt. Amidst the air resistance, I yelled, Are you nuts? What the hell do you think you're doing? His eyes never left my seatbelt. Then, as his gaze returned to me, he smiled a sinister grin and said, This is gonna be a wild ride, baby! Stop it! Get your hands off of me! He continued to yank the seatbelt until it finally came off. And the next thing I knew, my body was swinging around like a twig. <laughs> I held on for dear life, certain I would end up in a hospital bed, dead, or barely breathing. But by some odd miracle, I managed to survive this ordeal. The ride came to a stop, and that's when the other riders started engaging in a fight with whom they still thought was my boyfriend. Then, moments later, the attendants came to my aid. I wanted so badly to run after that creep. However, he found a way to escape unnoticed. And even after consulting with the security team, it was impossible to hold him accountable since it was like searching for a needle in a haystack. But after reflecting on the incident, I truly believe that he was the very same man who took the life of that young girl in the carnival years back. But what still gets me to this day was the warning our spirit tried to give me.